Being in Istanbul is inspiring. Here, nobody knows who I am. And beside the beauty of the city, in Turkey as an Islamic country, the level of education, the level of civilization in this country, the separation of mosque in politics, and the freedom that the women are enjoying in this country, I really enjoy the freedom. This is not the case in Kabul. It's always male-dominated. It's always discriminatory against women. So I began when I was very young to, to fight for equality. And now it's turned to be my habit. Some of the people keep saying that you are only fighting for women's rights. But I keep saying that, yes, women are human beings. So I'm fighting for human rights, not only for women's rights. And I believe that education is the main tool to empower the people to be able to protect their rights. So I came for a conference to speak a little bit about girls' education in Afghanistan. It's very well here. Thank you. Dr. Samar has the position of the chair of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. A lot of people think that Afghanistan is a hopeless cause, that nobody's educated, there's, there's, it's a disaster, and many of us don't feel that. Women's rights are human rights, and Dr. Samar believes without them, neither development is achieved, nor peace and stability maintained. We should not only focus on primary education, because primary education can only give you the possibility to read and write. It doesn't give you the possibility to be in a position of power in order to change the policy and the strategy within the country. What we need to do... Dr. Samar is definitely a hero. She is a tremendous role model. One just looks at Nasima, who works at her school. She is such a big inspiration in my life. I love her very much. Dr. Samara is the founder of uh, Garshad Institute of Higher Education, which is a newly established institute. Education for women is not very accepted among the Afghan people. So we wanted to get more women to Garshad Institute to have a higher education and to be able to get jobs. Dr. Samar is training girls to university level, and they're girls from, from large families, often it's one parent family, they have no money, and these girls want to go to school. They know that Afghanistan can be a better place. I keep telling the young girls and boys that our existence doesn't mean much if we cannot really bring positive change. But we are working against the conservative mentality and a different kind of violation of human rights. They burn the wife, they kill the wife. On girls, it's forced marriages, child marriages, forced prostitution sometimes. And they don't have, they don't have anything to do. They don't, they don't know what to do. They don't know what, where to go. I think she's going to have a tremendous challenge carrying on, but she will. She will. But she lives in danger every day. She has four bodyguards, an armored car. But she says one day there will be peace. She loves her country. She keeps going because she wants to be ready when that day is there. The job in Afghanistan is not done. We should not have the rule of gun. We should have the rule of law. And every citizen who lives in Afghanistan should have the equal rights. That's one of the reasons that I keep going. So I still call for justice. I still call for accountability. I still call for acknowledgement of the suffering of people. And I will not stop as long as I can.
corruption is something that people sometimes think is happening somewhere over there in a country that they know perhaps very little about. But in fact, major corruption, which is affecting many millions of people every day, is actually facilitated right here in our very own backyard by our whole global financial system and the lack of accountability and the problem of anonymous shell companies and the failure of our governments to really tackle this issue. And the big problem is that some of the poorest people in the world are not benefiting from the natural resources they own. So it's really important to know where the money goes from those resources. And if it's going into the pockets of corrupt officials and into the pockets of companies who were in collusion with those officials, then that's absolutely wrong. So a whole load of Global Witnesses campaigns look at the role of natural resources um, in funding conflict and corruption. So from that really has developed a lot of our methodology, which is about in-depth investigations, building up irrefutable evidence. Oh really? They know where the money's gone. And then really working to create very specific change to have an impact. We use a range of different ways of gathering information. Some of it is carrying in video cameras, uh, recording devices when we go into a country like Cambodia or Laos. But we also work with local researchers and people on the ground. We maintain very regular communication with some of the communities which have been impacted by these large-scale land investments. It's a great team here. It feels like you're juggling. Every day you've got a different ball in your hand and you're, you're trying to keep them all in the air to keep things going and to, to keep pushing things forwards. Yeah, which is why I'm asking you for guesstimates of these numbers so we can see. Do I stand any chance of getting this? Or, or Corrupt dictators who steal their country's money often want to get it to the West, using banks and wire transfers and companies to hide who that money belongs to. What we're actually talking about is one of the mechanisms that keeps poor countries and poor people poor. If there's anything happening in terms of intimidations, I've seen people with no economic power who can't pay a lawyer, who even have no idea about their own rights and are helpless against the power of politicians, of politics, against the power of logging companies, economic power, power of influence. For example, it might be as much as $10 is lost from Africa in illicit financial flows for every dollar that goes in in aid. So we're about trying to make governments do the right thing and business do the right thing. Sometimes it's focusing on looking at the national laws and making sure that the government is following its own laws. But in other cases, we look at the role of the company itself and whether or not there can be influence brought on the company through its investors, for example. And making companies responsible for their supply chains, checking their supply chains, making supply chains more transparent, publishing what they're doing and, and really holding companies publicly to account. For example, we alerted the world to the problem of blood diamonds. And there is law now in America and in Europe that covers the value of two thirds of the oil and gas and mining companies worldwide. We're changing how people think about an issue. And if we can make it harder for corrupt dictators to move their money around the world, then we make it harder for terrorists and armed smugglers to move their money around the world too. Change is long term, it won't happen overnight. And some people say corruption, it's just so complicated, you know, it's there, we can't do anything about it. So does that mean we just look the other way? I think not. I've always been an activist and this kind of work is work that I can't ignore and I can't step away from. Getting up out of bed each morning um, in order to, to do something that's actually going to, to change the world. When I started with Global Witness I had uh, nice curly brown hair and now it's grey and straight. But regardless of how difficult or scary it can be, I will, I will keep going and I'll keep fighting the fight. It's like creating a whole movement, it's like the anti-corruption movement. We're after getting the bad guys. Mahatma Gandhi said, if you want to change the country, you need to change and develop the villages first. <laughs>
1975, in our village, Ralegan Siddhi, I started creating a rural development plan and came across rampant government corruption. I realized that we cannot have sustainable development until we stop corruption. I'm not afraid of life or death. And I realized that once you're no longer afraid, changes are easy and nothing is impossible. The common people have so many problems in India due to corruption. Development has come to a complete stop. Life for the everyday man has become so difficult. Not even 10% of the government funding that's meant for them ends up getting to them. So in 1990, I started the fight. Annaji pursued for a Lokpal Act. The Lokpal Act is an act for curtailing the corruption in the country. And due to his consistent fight since last 20 years, People have got faith in Annaji. He is the only person in the country who is fighting against corruption. Annaji's goals are transparency in government and accountability to common people. All countrymen gave support by coming on roads, making rallies, candle light marches, so, government formed one committee for making this act, studying this act. People are fed up of because of the corruption. So, they are now joined Annaji's movement. Anna Hazare has devoted totally for the goodness of the society. <laughs> Anna Hazare believed in a total development of the human being. That's why he is the most important person in India. <laughs> they say we haven't seen Mahatma Gandhi, but we can see another Gandhi here. So people from all over the world, from all over the country, come here you know, just to see Anaji. And that's the people that get inspiration from him. They go to the village, they see all the development work which he has done. Environment. Today, the environment is a big concern for everybody. It has global implications. In the villages, rainwater flows to the dams and causes soil erosion, which affects the agricultural sector. So to stop soil erosion and promote water conservation in our village, we created a watershed training center in Ralegan Siddhi. As a result of this program, we saw many positive changes come about. People started getting more work and earning more money. Also, the migration from villages to cities has been significantly reduced. Watershed development, like uh, tree plantation, forest development, and the schools here, There is a school for failed children. That's a very new concept. The child is given a priority. And the result here comes out of 100. Proper education is given to the children. It will definitely prevent the corruption in the human life as well as the country. Youth are the future of our nation. From the very beginning, I've been working with young people. With their help, the anti-corruption movement has awakened all of India. I've been jailed many times by opposing politicians. There have been death threats made against me. People hired contract killers, but these killers said, 
We don't want to kill Anna Hazare. Today there is less corruption. People think I cannot stop it, but I trust that we surely can. And a day will come, a total corruption will be removed from the human life of Indian people. I'm very sure about that. I fight corruption for the common people. If they get hurt, I get hurt. Social transformation is not easy. It's difficult, but not impossible. And so the fight goes on. I just keep on going until my last breath.